morning, Quest. Uh, welcome. I want to give a special welcome to our youth and our children in service today, recognizing uh, that you're joining us, that you're sitting in this space, and that you are actively a part um, of the life of this church. I also want to welcome our online community as well. My name is Pastor Matt, and I'm very honored to be sharing this word with you today. As we're getting started, I would like to actually ask a specific request from our kids and youth today. I have two strong beliefs, you see. One is that I believe the children are our future. <laughs> Teach them well. And, right? You know, you know that one. I, I, I actually do. Um, I'm right there with Whitney. I believe that the children are our future. I believe that kids and youth have such profound and important insights about the world. And we just have to give space to hear them. Amen? Secondly, I believe that art is one of the most powerful ways for us to communicate our thoughts and ideas. So kids and youth, I'm going to ask you, both in service and online, we're going to be talking this morning about pressing into a faith that feels exciting and alive. Because I think you all have such creative ideas and because I think art is such a beautiful way to share those ideas, I want to know if you would be willing to draw us a picture during this service time. We have both on the table over there and back with some of our materials for our kids and youth, we have green blank paper for you to draw on. But I'd love for you to draw a picture of faith that excites you. Another way to put it is, what is it that you look forward to when you come to church, when you talk about your beliefs, when you talk about God, when you talk about Jesus, what excites you? And I would love to see that in a visual representation if you feel so inclined. Those who are joining us online, if you would like, you could take a picture of that and send it to us at info at seattlequest.org. Um, or if you're in person and you would like to, I have a basket up here. And during our communion time, I would love to invite any of you who feel comfortable sharing to drop off your images in this. And at our benediction time, I would love to share a couple of those. Now, adults, you can definitely draw. That's cool. Go for it. Um, but I am going to ask that we reserve this space for our kids and youth because I want to make sure that we are focusing and centering at the end of service on their voices, on the pictures they have. Amen? Can we do that? Wait. Um, it's when I step away from my notes. I'm going to keep it tight today, though. So we have that as a beautiful opportunity that I want to prep. Um, and in advance, I'd love to thank any of our kids and youth that choose to participate in that. We're going to continue in our message today looking at our central text from Mark 9, 14 through 29. Will you read with me? Not audibly, because it's a really long text, but you know, along in your hearts and minds. When they came, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them, and some scribes arguing with them. When the whole crowd saw Jesus, they were immediately overcome with awe and ran forward to greet him. He asked them, what are you arguing about with them? Someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought you my son. He has a spirit that makes him unable to speak, and whenever it seizes him, it dashes him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid, and I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. He answered them, You faithless generation, how much longer must I be with you? How much longer must I put up with you? Bring him to me. And they brought the boy to him. When the spirit saw him, it immediately convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about, foaming at the mouth. So Jesus asked the father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you are able to do anything, help us. Have compassion on us. Jesus said to him, if you are able, all things can be done for the one who believes. Well, immediately the father of the child cried out, I believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit saying, you spirit that keeps this boy from speaking and hearing, I command you come out of him and never enter him again. 
After crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse. So that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he was able to stand. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. I was gonna have a picture up on the screen of me from high school, but you can just imagine this with like bleached tips and a puka shell necklace. That's, a, that's about where I landed in high school. Um, I grew up as a pastor's kid and I can see many of you thinking, oh, the tattoos make sense. <laughs> Those pastor's kids, watch out. I did most of my substantial growing up in the khaki clad floral print appropriated valley of central California. My dad was a pastor of a community at a predominantly middle, upper middle class white church. The church was more culturally Christian than anything else, and it placed a heavy, and I mean heavy emphasis, on purity from the debauched things of this world. See, my youth group had, as a worship fixture, what they called save songs. An example, exit night, boom, 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 boom. enter light, take God's hand. Then you will be born again. Now, it was a tall feat to save a Metallica song, but by golly, they did it. <laughs> yes. It was 1997, and the Foo Fighters album, The Color and the Shape, had just come out. I used a day's worth of my Subway Sandwich artist money and wore that album out. At this point in my life, I had been slowly pulling myself away from church and growing more and more disconnected from the faith of those saved songs and right living. I must note, just for a second, that I am extremely grateful for parents that gave me space in that part of my life for that part of my journey. It was a gift. While most of my faith deconstruction during that time stemmed from these deeper questions I had that were consistently being ignored or demeaned by youth leaders, I actually ended up feeling, experiencing, and processing that deconstruction through music. I was compelled by artists like the Beatles or Stevie Wonder who leaned into difficult questions through their lyrics. De La Soul and the Beastie Boys rapped about experiences I could barely understand, but that felt so authentic and real to me. Music was an instrumental space for me in understanding the complexities of life and of my faith. And so when a youth leader cornered me at a birthday party, I was somewhat indignant at her suggestion that I replace my Foo Fighters album with uh, this new Christian group called Switchfoot. See, I became all the more resolute and antagonistic towards most things labeled Christian, defining myself by what I wasn't. It was a referential definition. I am not Switchfoot or Newsboys or Jars of Clay or POD or Audio Adrenaline or what would people think if they say I'm a Jesus freak? You know, all those uh, classics of decent Christian talk. That's what it stands for. Do you guys know that? DC Talk. Anybody who, who heard that band? Decent Christian talk. Yeah. Toby Mac, and the Mac is back, no slack. On the DC track is jacked, beyond comprehension. I believe that. Anyway, yeah, watch out. <laughs> watch out, folks. See, deconstruction wasn't a concept in my cultural context at that time in my life. It was very much a non-existent term, but I was very much in the thick of it. I remember most of that time in my life feeling as though I was just always treading water. I didn't have any models to look to as an anchor for what I was processing through. So much of my sense of faith, God, and myself was framed by the negative, what I wasn't. So while our text today is rich with many truths that speak into our faith, the task, right, of preaching is we're going to zero in on one aspect because we got about 25 if I keep moving away from my notes, 35 maybe, I don't know, <laughs> minutes to cover something. So what I would like to do this morning is highlight how this text can illuminate poignant prin principles regarding the intersection of our faith and this important work of deconstruction. 
Over these next 20 minutes or so, I'd like for us to look at three groups in this Mark text. One, the scribes, two, the disciples, and three, who I'd like to call the resurrected. It's my intent that at the end of our time together, we will not only rescue poor Switchfoot from the deconstructed trash heap of 90s mat, but ultimately we will see that deconstructing our faith while important in untangling harmful cultural beliefs that get tacked onto our faith is incomplete and ineffective if we stop at the negative, if we stop at what we are not. Our faith shouldn't be referential, but it should point us to new wine, new possibilities, the miraculous, and point us to a liberating power of resurrection. Amen? This, in part, is why we are in this current sermon series, Mysteries and Miracles. The parables, these mysteries, provide metaphoric images and language to help us challenge much of this white Western-centric evangelical claims around certainty, moralistic relativism that have become culturally saturated in our culture and used by particular groups to stake a colonized claim on our Christianity. And in equal measure, the miracles model for us a power that adds traction to the deconstruction work of the parables. Additionally, miracles remind us of who we are, the resurrected, the liberated, into new life, and as Pastor Aaron preached last week, a life more abundantly. You see, Quest, we were meant to live for so much more. You see where we're going. A little context for our passage. Just before our passage, Jesus, Peter, James, and John had all had a miraculous, amazing experience up high on a mountaintop. They witnessed Jesus's transfiguration, and that just means that it was a complete change in form and appearance to something more beautiful and radiant. Jesus was glowing. They heard the voice of God, this is my son, listen to him. They saw Moses and Elijah literally appear before them. All in all, it was a pretty miraculous experience. But as they come down from this mountain, they are immediately confronted with a full-on argument between the nine disciples left behind and the temple scribes of that region. So here's our first group. During this time, there are different religious leaders prominent in the Jewish community. Most notably, there are the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were different sects with the title of scribes, more referring to a profession, not a particular sect of Jewish thought. Scribes were known to be experts on the law of Moses and functioned more like lawyers in that they handled contracts, resolved disputes, and maintained high commitment to the traditions and religious regulations of their culture. Similar to today, Pharisees or Sadducees could be scribes, like pastors can also function as theologians. But in their interpretive frame, they shaped how they went about reading their sacred texts. As an example to present day time, we, uh, the author Wayne Grundum uh, might be seen as a scribe in the Reformed theology sect, and N.T. Wright, a scribe using a more progressive interpretive frame out of the Anglican tradition. Both individuals pressing into the same sacred text, but drawing at times, very different conclusions. Does that make sense? So we don't know what sect these particular scribes are from, but we do know that they are in the throes of an argument with the disciples. Now, it'd be easy for us to place the full weight of blame for this argument on the scribes. They're trying to discredit Jesus, or they're being gatekeepers. They need some good old-fashioned deconstruction, See, after all, this, same, this is the same group that in Matthew 23, Jesus woes at, W-O-E, woe sat. He calls them hypocrites, blind guides, whitewashed tombs, snakes, and a brood of vipers. Pretty harsh terminology. Clearly, Jesus will easily identify the source of this argument as the uninvestigated and unexamined thinking of those scribes, Right? Let's go back to our text. In verse 16, Jesus asks what this argument is all about, and we're introduced to two of the soon-to-be-resurrected. A demon-possessed boy and his exhausted, cynical father. 
Well, surely after hearing the father's cry and based on our previous interactions with the scribes, Jesus will use this as another teaching opportunity to deconstruct the theology of the scribes. Woe to you who haven't interrogated your thinking. Deconstruct, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's not from the Bible. I, I just wrote that there. But Jesus doesn't. In fact, the scribes, the group symbolizing the dominant religious system at this time, all but disappears after we're introduced to the boy and his father. Instead, Jesus turns towards his disciples and calls out, you faithless generation. The disciples at this point have more or less been on an intensive three-year deconstruction retreat with Jesus. It was epic. They've heard him teach about destroying the temple, being born again. Jesus challenged rigid Sabbath practices in Luke 6, 9, and not only deconstructs culturally assumed ethnic boundaries and gender norms, the Samaritan woman at the well, but also greatly expands how the disciples were to understand worship, no longer contained in a structure or a place, but made manifest in spirit and truth. They have seen, experienced, heard, and been in the thick of deconstruction. The disciples have been the prototype for deconstruction. They were the rebel sect of Judaism that's going around challenging traditions and rites and rituals of faith. On top of that, we see just a few chapters earlier in Mark 6 that they had already been given the authority to heal and cast out demons and in verse 12 and 13 had success in doing so. So when we hear the father report, I asked your disciples to cast it out, but they could not do so. We should wonder why. What's happening in this instance that has changed what we previously have seen possible by the disciples? Our scene shows us that there is a father and a son, and they are in desperate need of healing, life, hope, compassion. But the disciples, as we see, are preoccupied with their argument. The father and son are left on the margins. Now, before going any further, I'd like to note that challenging oppressive beliefs and systems contending for justice and, and equity raising our voices, that matters. But if at any time the argument causes us to miss the marginalized, oppressed, hurting, the literal in our text voiceless around us, then we've missed what really matters. Because church, we were meant to live. So perhaps the disciples forgot the miracles they've been witnessing up to this point. Maybe they forgot that Jesus's miracles were always intended to liberate, not litigate. Just a chapter earlier in Mark 8, the disciples are faced with a miracle they've seen before, feeding a multitude of impoverished and hungry people, but they still tell Jesus to send them away. They forget that Jesus had already fed the multitude. They were meant to live for so much more, and there was a forgetting that regularly happened. Maybe the disciples got drawn in by the sense of, of power that argumentation can often provide us. You see, in the next chapter, we hear James and John arguing with the other disciples about power and who will have a privileged seat in God's kingdom. Power is tempting. But quest, we were meant to live for so much more. I once spent a whole summer debating with Mormon missionaries and church elders simply because I enjoyed the argument more than the reason for our conversation. Deconstruction can often camp out in this space, can't it? If it's not held in balance, the argument, the negative. I have so often forgotten that the end goal of deconstruction should always point towards liberation, healing, and life. When it doesn't, I can feel myself drawn towards debates or arguments as a way to feel validated or empowered. So I hear Jesus say, woe to you, Matt, who chooses the safety that comes from arguing out of my own ability because I have left children ignored and the desperate without hope. So church, how do we work balance into this space? We know that deconstruction is important. 
especially in our current context where so much has been tacked on to our faith? How do we hold the tension and the balance of noting what we're not, but not staying there? Well, here's where we need to turn our focus away from the scribes and the disciples, and we need to look towards the resurrected, the boy, the father, and Jesus, creator sets free. See, for me, deconstruction began when a close friend came out as gay to me. Shortly after that, I found a classmate uh, in the bathroom so hopeless that he had come to school with pills, the intention of taking his life. No one in my church community could give me answers that seemed helpful or life-focused for them. They told me I needed to trust God more in this situation or set my thoughts on higher things. Don't associate, stay pure, unblemished. I ended up finding more solace more solace in the the music of Annie DeFranco or Riot Girl than I did at my church. But My own solace did nothing for my friend, did nothing for my classmate, it did nothing for that young boy in our text today, tormented day and night, cut off from community, left alienated from others, barely on the margins of society with a spirit that had literally taken his voice and a spirit that sought to destroy this child. Quest, my friend, That classmate, this boy was meant to live for so much more. Amen? Just last week, the co-founder of the online community group Queer Theology was viciously attacked online by the hate group Libs of TikTok. This spirit bent on silencing and destroying is still active today. This does not just exist in the pages of our text It's happening today. This spirit is present with the intent to destroy. These manifestations may look different than first century Galilee, but this spirit still torments. The young boy, my high school classmate, the targets of online hate groups. This spirit seeks death, not life, but quest. We were meant to live. Amen? For so much more. You see, the father in our story knew this. The man with leprosy in Matthew 8 knew this. We were meant to live. The woman with the issue of blood knew this. Jairus and his daughter knew this. The Canaanite woman, the Syrophoenician woman, Peter's mother-in-law, the centurion and his servant. Lazarus knew. The father knew who watched his son suffer for years, felt the loss of community, alienated by society. The father who had tried everything and now was on the edge of hopelessness. He knew. See, while the scribes and disciples used his son as a talking point in their debate, while the crowds watched on, this father had a faint voice that said, you, you were meant to live. Your son, your son was meant to live. Live for so much more than what's happening right now. So in the midst of failure and disappointment, this father cries out to Jesus over the crowd and yelling and arguments. He cries out, help us. Have compassion on us. Jesus zeroes his focus. Focuses on this man and his son. All things can be done for the one who believes, he says to this broken down man. And the man responds in contrast to the crowd who is interested but not invested. In contrast to the scribes concerned with laws more than life. In contrast to the disciples caught up in the critique rather than the need right in front of them. This father shouts out five 
of the most balanced, deconstructed words in the Bible. I believe. Help my unbelief. You want a model for balanced deconstruction? There it is right there. I believe. Help my unbelief. James Cone, in his book, God the Oppressed, makes this claim. The Christian community, therefore, is that community that freely becomes oppressed. Because they know that Jesus himself has defined humanity's liberation in the context of what happens to the little ones. Christians join the cause of the oppressed in the fight for justice, not because of some philosophical principle of the good or because of a religious feeling of sympathy for people in prison. Sympathy does not change the structures of injustice. The authentic identity of Christians with the poor is found in the claim which the Jesus encounter lays upon their own lifestyle, a claim that connects the word Christian with the liberation of the poor. I love how Cone says that. It connects the word Christian with the liberation of the poor. I want to take a bit of an aside. It was, I've been here at Quest for about 15 years now um, and never wanted to <laughs> be a pastor. <laughs> um, Partly is because of what I witnessed my dad go through, my parents go through. Um, part of it was because um, I, I wrestled with, with what sort of witness I would have if I had that title of pastor. And so whenever I would be out in the world, um, I would never say that I worked at a church. And I'd say, I work for a faith-based community. <laughs> Sometimes I'd be like real Seattle. I go, I work for a justice oriented faith based community. <laughs> but this text, specifically what Cohn says here, the claim that connects the word Christian with the liberation of the poor, hit me when I read it. If I'm constantly avoiding a title that, yes, has been used to hurt and harm and abuse and I avoid that title, I let that word exist as a representation of abuse and of oppression. But if I grab a hold of that word and I let it not only sit with me, but live itself out in the ways that I am present with others, that word has an opportunity to be reclaimed. I am a Christian. And I don't have to shy away from that, but I do need to make sure that my life is one that reflects the core of that word, as Cone says, that is connected to the liberation. Amen? So what happens next is Jesus heals this boy. It's beautiful. He liberates him, but it's not pretty. The passage says it was violent. And afterwards, those looking on thought the boy was dead. But in the end, the boy was set free. I love my ability to have deconstructed my faith. It has been a gift in my life. Um, just the other night, my partner and I were talking about how some of that deconstruction that I did before we met, I think helped our relationship, um, helped me enter in in a way that I could hear them better um, with more authentic ears. I love what deconstruction has done in my life and allowed me to find a more authentic faith. However, I lament the ways in which I've let the negative bent of my deconstruction be the totality of my faith. I lament the times when I 
framed how I entered into a relationship with somebody based on what I wasn't rather than what I was. Someone who believes that our God yearns for wholeness in us. Someone who sees my friend in all of their queerness as whole and complete and beautiful. Someone who recognizes the depths of depravity and brokenness in our world and yet still believes that our God can bring life out of that. If I'm constantly defined by the negative, what is it that people are drawn to? Where is the power of this resurrection? This boy silenced, tormented day and night, being freed from that. That doesn't happen by just defining what Jesus isn't. That happens by Jesus standing in power and using that power to liberate the people around him. Amen? So here's, well, sure, that's cool. I know I talk fast. I don't give a lot of pauses in this space. Because of my talking fast, this is actually where I think I want us to close. Ish. You know, when we say close, right? Because I'm always waiting to send the piano player up. I'm like, they said close. Are they ready for it? Close-ish. I want us to camp on this idea. Compassion leads to the identification and death leads to resurrection. Cohn, in his quote that we just read, recognizes that an essential quality of liberation requires identification. Jesus has compassion on this family. He enters into their story and beautifully, he participates collectively in their liberation. He invites them into the liberation process. And so they shout out, I believe, help my unbelief. If you are here today, either online or in person, and you most relate to this father and his son, on the edge of hopelessness, but knowing deep down that you were meant to live for so much more than this. I want you to know that we here at Quest desire to be a community that identifies with your struggle, that hears it and commits to standing with you before Jesus, creator sets free to cry out, I believe, help my unbelief. For those of us this morning who feel more like the disciples, we know that deconstruction leads to death, but this is a good thing. If systems and beliefs and churches and theologies skew towards abuse and oppression, then they need to die. Amen? They need to die. There is no place in the kingdom of God for abuse and oppression. There just isn't. There's no nuancing it. There's no skirting around it. There's no exceptions to the rule. There is no place in God's kingdom for that. So it needs to die. But just because death is a necessary part of deconstructing our faith, it is not the final part. The phrase in our text where Jesus took the boy by the hand and lifted him up is the same phrasing we see used when describing Jairus' daughter, being resurrected. The point of deconstruction should always move us into new life. Deconstruction is important in rescuing our faith from abusive systems and groups that would seek to leverage our faith in an attempt towards consolidating and increasing their power. And we see that. We see that in our media, I see it on the faces of many friends or people when I finally tell them I'm a pastor. <laughs> Deconstruction is important, as I said, in rescuing our faith from abusive systems. However, 
deconstruction is left weak and anemic when it doesn't point towards the miraculous power of the, deconst- of the resurrection. Point, Cone points this out by reminding us that the word Christian only holds its liberating, r- resurrecting power when it's connected to the liberation of the poor and the oppressed. And deconstruction can be a helpful tool for that. But we can't shy away from things that feel perhaps too Christian. Prayer matters. It's interesting that during this time, a common practice for the Jewish people was to have three times a day that they prayed. So when I grew up, I heard passages that Jesus would say, when you pray, and then that was used as a way to, to give very clear instructions about the right kinds of prayer. But perhaps what we're really seeing is Jesus is looking at these practices that are already at work in people's lives. He's saying, hey, that morning prayer you do, don't stop doing it. There's goodness in that. Prayer matters. It connects us to a liberating God. It reminds us that this work is not of our own abilities, but it needs to be in partnership with a liberating God. Prayer matters. But when you pray, shift your gaze a little. Change how you go about that. Don't just fall into rote practice. We, as a church, need to be bold in claiming our faith. And I get it. That comes with a lot of nuance. To be bold, but still humble. To be committed to our principles, but still balanced and sensitive to the harm and pain and trauma and abuse many have experienced from the church. And so we walk that fine line. During this sermon series, we have been uh, ending out with some questions to consider throughout the week. Here are two questions I'd like to put before us, and then I want to wrap up um, what I have to share. The first question is this. How do you, oh, awesome. How do you, or might you, experience a liberatory faith day to day? That parenthetical, or might you, is a good example of my deconstruction, right? I want to be balanced. I don't want to just assume that you're experiencing it, but maybe you do. A second question for us to think about throughout the week is how do you, or might you, live out that liberatory faith to others in your day-to-day life? In 2003, Switchfoot finally found their way into my ears. I told you we were going to rescue them. They found their way through this album called The Beautiful Letdown, which is celebrating its 20th year anniversary today, which makes me feel something about my age. But that's cool. That's cool. It found me in Flagstaff, Arizona, and fully in my skeptic era. Ironically, I was working with my dad at a small community church, but I found joy. I reveled in finding anything negative I could critique about the church, faith, and everything else in between. So when this faux Foo Fighters Christian album came on, I was not expecting much. I I had to practice saying that, by the way. Faux Foo Fighters. Track three came on. Alec, you can come up now. It says this. Fumbling his confidence and wondering why the world has passed him by. Hoping that he's bet for more than arguments and failed attempts to fly. Something shook in me. The chorus. We were meant to live for so much more. 
Have we lost ourselves somewhere we live inside? I sat in my car and I could feel my heart soften. Years of building up this calcified protection. Years of defining myself by all the things I knew I didn't want to be. The practices I knew were hurting people in my life. I heard that we were meant to live for so much more. Something softened. The bridge. We want more than this world has to offer. We want more than this world has to offer. We want more than the wars of our fathers. Everything inside screams for second life. Quest. You were meant to live for so much more than just what we're not. It is my earnest desire that wherever you are in your faith, you know that you were made with intention and you were made for resurrection. You were made for second life. You were made for life and liberation and authentic wholeness quest we were meant to live for so much more. Amen? Amen. Kids, I'm so grateful for you being in this space. Youth, youth, I'm so grateful for you being in this space. If you feel comfortable as we move into this time of communion, I would love to hear and see your perspectives. I think they matter. I think they show us something that I could never say that we could never know without you present in this space, in this sanctuary, at this moment. We need you. Those of you online, we need your reflections. We want this to continue throughout the week. So as you feel comfortable during our time of communion, feel free to bring those up. If you're online, feel free to take a picture and send them to us. I, I love leading worship. For those who are maybe this is your first time, hi, I lead worship. I love it. It's where I find my, um, my grounding. It's where I see pictures of who God has called me to be, not just who I'm not. And so the beautiful irony of this is the last time I gave a sermon, <laughs> I went to Pastor Gail. I said, I don't think I'm a sermon sort of person. Uh, it, just, it just didn't feel right in my soul. So I said, ah, you know, I, I love leading worship. But to Pastor Gail's leadership and her insight, I think it was ordained for me to say something today. And maybe it has nothing to do with all of you. I don't know. But I know that for me and in this process, God has helped me recapture something. God has reminded me that I am meant to live for so much more and I pray that you hear God's voice saying that to you as well this morning. We want more than this world has to offer. We want more than the wars of our fathers because everything inside of us, Quest, screams, cries out. I believe, help my unbelief, it cries out for this second life. 
So will you pray with me? Pray not because that's what we do at the end of a sermon. Pray because you were meant to live for so much more than just rituals. Pray because you have something to pray about. Pray because you have someone in your mind that needs to know that they were meant for so much more. So Quest, will you pray with me? Jesus, creator sets free, God of the oppressed, the liberator, we come before you. Lord, and we say, we believe, and in those spaces, Lord, help our unbelief. Help us to point to the miraculous work of resurrection. Help us to point to life and life abundantly. Help us not shy away from mysteries, but recognize how mysteries reveal the grandeur of who you are. And in doing so, Lord, help us proclaim life for the people around us. And we can only do that, Lord, through your power, through the miraculous work of what our faith is grounded in. Christ resurrected and us followers of Jesus, Christians living into that resurrection power. Thank you. In your precious name, amen.